Few philosophers have more obviously changed the world than Hegel, both personally through his influence on German nationalism and indirectly through the work of his most famous philosophical disciple, Karl Marx, after whom a great many governments in our own day actually call themselves. So if we want to see some of the practical consequences of Hegel's ideas, all we have to do is look at the world in which we ourselves live. His influence on philosophy was correspondingly great. In fact, it's been said that the history of philosophy since Hegel can be understood as a succession of varying reactions against his work. He was born in Stuttgart in 1770. A teacher of one sort or another for most of his life, he eventually became professor of philosophy at Heidelberg and then in Berlin. As a philosopher, he was a late developer. But by the time of his death in 1831, he was very much the dominant figure in philosophy throughout the whole of Germany. The titles of some of his most influential works are The Phenomenology of Mind, The Science of Logic, The Philosophy of Right, and The Philosophy of History. Hegel had several followers who themselves became well-known, but far and away the most famous is Karl Marx. Marx was born in Germany in 1818, and as a young student of philosophy was very much a Hegelian. He didn't become a socialist until his mid-twenties, when he began to develop that rich and highly original mixture of German philosophy, French politics, and British economics, which is Marxism. Together with a wealthy young industrialist, Friedrich Engels, he wrote the Communist Manifesto in 1848. The partnership between Marx and Engels must be just about the most momentous collaboration in the history of ideas. Engels kept Marx for most of his life so that he could produce his writings, and it was a life spent largely in exile because of Marx's political activities. At the age of 31, he went to live in London and stayed there until his death in 1883. He's buried in Highgate Cemetery. For many years, he worked in the British Museum in its reading room, and it was there that he wrote his masterpiece, Das Kapital, published in 1867. Marxism isn't quite philosophy in the accepted meaning of the term, but there's obviously a major philosophical element in it, and that element always remained Hegelian. What I propose to do in this program is devote the bulk of the discussion to Hegel, and then show how some of the most important of the ideas we've been discussing were incorporated into Marxism. With me to do this is someone who has published excellent introductions to the works of both thinkers, Peter Singer, Professor of Philosophy at Monash University in Melbourne, Australia. Professor Singer, Hegel is notorious for being difficult to read, for being obscure. He's often described as the most obscure of all the major philosophers. Yet your little book about him has the conspicuous merit of discussing his central ideas in ordinary plain English. And I hope you're going to be able to do the same on this program. When you're confronted with the task of expounding Hegel's ideas, where do you find the most convenient place to start? I start with the philosophy of history, because the history in Hegel is quite concrete. Part of the difficulty with Hegel is that he's so abstract, but the history, because it's concrete, is an easy way in to the more abstract parts of his philosophy. Well, that in itself is already a new departure in philosophy, isn't it? Because no major philosopher before Hegel regarded history or the philosophy of history as being important. Yes, it is a departure. Compare it with Kant, for instance. Kant had a view of human nature as human beings eternally divided between their reasoning element and their brute desires. It's a bit like the old picture of man as halfway between the apes and the angels. And for Kant, that was just a, a fact of human nature. We would always be torn with this division, this conflict. But Hegel said, no, wait a minute, uh, this isn't something immutable. Look at Greek society. Greek society, Hegel said, was more harmonious. People were not conscious of this gulf or division. Their desires were in harmony with their reason. So the point that Kant is talking to, is talking about this division, is something that has occurred historically, has developed with the rise of individual conscience in Protestant Europe. And because it's happened historically, it need not be a permanent feature. It could, in some other period, actually again be overcome and a harmony restored. Hegel looked at all important concepts in this historical way, didn't he? <clears throat> he saw them as being 
embedded in human life, in ways of life, in societies, and as societies change, so the concepts change. Isn't that right? Yes, that's absolutely right. Uh, he saw that there was development in the way history occurred, that it was always moving forward. It was always a process, never static. And he had a name for the way in which it moved forward. He called this the dialectical process. Now, can you explain exactly what, in Hegel's mind, the dialectical process was? Let's go back to the example I mentioned before. <laughs> Greek society he saw as a harmony, but as a simple harmony. A simple harmony in the sense that people had not developed the alternative notion of individual conscience. There was harmony between the individual and society because individuals hadn't really thought about things themselves. Now, into that simple harmony, there came, in the person, in fact, of, of Socrates, whom Hegel considers a, a world historical figure, there came the idea of questioning this harmony. Socrates went around asking people, what is justice? What is virtue? And when they tried to answer, they realized that they'd accepted certain conventions, which Socrates had no trouble in showing could not be sustained. So the simple harmony of Greek society broke down, and because Socrates broke it down, incidentally, Hegel thinks that the Athenians were quite right to condemn Socrates to death. He was genuinely corrupting and subverting Athenian society. But that was an essential part of a historical process because ultimately, and Hegel fills in the, the gaps, the steps, but ultimately that led to the rise of individual conscience, and a second necessary element, and the opposite of Greek society. So we've moved from what Hegel calls the thesis to the antithesis, the antithesis of Greek society is individual conscience risen to its height in Protestant Europe. But that too turns out to be unstable. It leads to the destruction of the French Revolution and the terror that followed the French Revolution. And so that too must give way to a synthesis, to a third stage, which combines harmony and individual conscience. And very often in this process, that then again serves as the new thesis from which a further antithesis will arise and the process will continue. Now, this notion of dialectical change that you've just explained has been so influential ever since Hegel, and it's enormously influential today through Marxism, which embodies it, that I think we must get it completely clear in our minds. So let me just go over it again. The idea is, isn't it, that Hegel put forward <coughs> that... The reason why we human beings are involved in a process of perpetual change is that every complex situation contains within itself conflicting elements which therefore destabilize the situation. And therefore the situation cannot go on indefinitely. It breaks down into something else within which those conflicts are dissolved or assuaged. But then, of course, in the new situation you get new conflicts. Uh, and so it goes on indefinitely. So you get, as you put it just now, thesis, antithesis, synthesis, which becomes a new thesis using his terminology. And this, Hegelians, and following them, Marxists think, gives us the key to history, to understanding historical change, the dialectical process. Now, up to that point in the explanation, it would have been open to Hegel to say that uh, the direction that this change took was purely accidental. It could be the random outcome of innumerable random conflicts. But he doesn't say that, does he? He actually thinks this linear process has a direction, has a goal. That's right. And the goal for Hegel is the greater development of mind towards freedom. We are moving always towards consciousness of freedom, towards realizing human freedom and understanding freedom. And that is a process of increasing awareness of freedom and of increasing knowledge of ourselves. Now, what is this change happening to? I mean, wherever we talk of change, in any context, whatever, there must be something identifiable that changes. Now, what is it that's changing? In other words, is he writing about whole societies? Is he writing about individuals? What what is he writing about in this context? The, the, the short answer is that he's writing neither about individuals nor about societies, but about what he calls Geist. Now, that German word Geist is a difficult one to translate. 
the easiest way, perhaps, would be to say that it happens to mind. Mind is one normal translation of the German word Geist. We mean, when we talk about mental illness, the German word Geisteskrankhaft is, is mentally ill. So you could say it's happening to mind, to your mind and mine, or all our individual minds. But mind also has another meaning, which goes beyond that, the notion of spirit. We talk about the Zeitgeist, the spirit of the times. Or we talk about Geist when Germans talk about uh, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. The word Ghost. Heiliger Geist. Heiliger Geist, exactly. Yes. So uh, it also has, therefore, a somewhat spiritual or religious flavor, which suggests that in some sense there's a reality above and beyond your and my individual mind. And so you could say it's happening to mind, but mind with a capital M, not just mind in the sense of individual human mind. So is Hegel saying then that total reality is something mental or spiritual, or this word geist may be poised between the mental and the spiritual, and that all the processes that we're talking about are, hap are processes ultimately of this ultimate mental or spiritual thing? Yes, that's the ultimate view that, that Hegel comes down to, that mm. reality is geist, it's mm. ultimately mental or intellectual, and these processes happen to Geist, to mind, as it develops along the, pro along the yeah. way. Now, to some people listening to the discussion, this might already begin to sound like a very bizarre idea. So I think it's worth pointing out that, in fact, we're all very familiar with something similar to this in the case of religious beliefs, even if we ourselves are not religious people. I mean, many religious believers, including many Christians, believe that all of reality is ultimately spiritual and that all of reality ultimately has a spiritual or significance or meaning. And I suppose Hegel is saying something very closely related to that, is he? Though not necessarily religious in the conventional sense. Yes, but the difference might be that the orthodox Christian view, I think, holds that, that God is spiritual but separate from the world, and the world is mundane and material. Mm. Although it has a spiritual significance, certainly, but it's separate from it. But for Hegel there's a closer union between the two. You could present uh, the opposite of the Christian view by saying that Hegel is a pantheist, that he believes that God is in the world and in everything. That's perhaps not quite true either, but it's somewhere between the traditional Christian conception and the pantheistic one, that reality is part of God, everything is a manifestation of God, if you want to call it that. In fact, I mean, it would be true to say that ever since Hegel, there has been a dispute between Hegel scholars or philosophers about precisely this question relating to Hegel's philosophy. Is Hegel's philosophy ultimately religious or not? There are some who've said that it is. There are some who've maintained that it isn't. Which side of that debate do you come down on? I think that it is immensely valuable to try and interpret Hegel as if he were not religious because then you find that you can make good sense of a large part of Hegel's philosophy in a non-religious way, just interpreting him as talking about mind and the common element in mind being our common ability to reason, the fact that our minds are structured in similar principles. But I think I have to admit that though you can push that a long way, you don't really make 100% sense of Hegel in that way. The last 10% perhaps has to assume that there is some religious or quasi-religious view of, of mind or spirit that lies behind what he's saying. Now, we've talked about the view of, the rea of reality as a historical process, which he introduced into Western thought. It's a major idea. And we've talked about this notion of dialectical change, which he introduced and which is a living idea to this day. Another important concept, which I think I'm right in saying he coined, certainly he made it famous, and which has come back again into what one might call intellectual fashion in recent decades is the concept of alienation. Hegel had a great deal to say about alienation, didn't he? Now, what exactly did he mean by that term? By alienation, Hegel meant the idea that something which is in fact us or part of us seems to us foreign, alien, and hostile. Let me give you an example. He presents a picture of what he calls the unhappy soul, which is an alienated form of religion. The unhappy soul is the person who prays to a God whom he regards as all-powerful, all-knowing, and all-good, 
and who sees himself by contrast as powerless, ignorant, and base. So this person is unhappy because he demeans himself and puts all those qualities into some being which he sees as separate for himself. Hegel says that this is wrong. We I are, in fact, part of God, or if you like, we are projecting our qualities into God, and we should take that back. The way to overcome that kind of alienation would be to realize that we and God are one, and that we have those qualities. They are not something separate and foreign to us. I was going to say, he would say specifically that these are human, and perhaps only human, qualities which we are projecting onto an all-powerful being, denying them to ourselves, when it is, in fact, we who have them. I mean, well, they originate with humanity. The claim that they are only human was actually made by one of his later disciples, Ludwig Feuerbach. He wouldn't have said that, but he would have said that we and that kind of divine spirit are all part of the same reality, Geist or mind. Now, you've explained very clearly, I think, how Hegel saw total reality as being a process of change which was moving forward in a certain way, the dialectical movement, what is it going towards? What is the goal? What's the end of this movement? The end point of the dialectical process is mind coming to know itself as the ultimate reality and thus as seeing everything that it took to be foreign and hostile to itself as in fact part of itself. And that for Hegel is simultaneously a state of absolute knowledge when mind knows, recognizes at last itself as the ultimate reality, and also a state of absolute freedom when mind, instead of being controlled by external forces, is able to order the world in a rational way because now it sees that the world is in fact itself and it only has to implement its own principle of rationality onto the world to organize the world rationally. Now the interesting thing about this culminating process is that because it occurs once mind understands that it is the reality of everything, if you ask the question, when does this actually happen? Well, it happens when Hegel's mind, Hegel's own mind in his philosophical writings and thoughts, grasps the idea that mind is everything. And then he's, he's achieved this. It's not just that Hegel describes the goal, the culmination of all this process, but Hegel's philosophy actually is the very culmination of the whole process he's describing. So when Hegel published his main works, that was total reality at last, achieving awareness of itself, achieving self-knowledge. Yes. It's an amazing piece of sort of grandiose uh, self-projection on the part of a philosopher. I'm not sure quite that Hegel realized that it could be seen in this light. Now, one thing that strikes one uh, about the aim towards all which all this is moving in the way you just put it is that it's sometimes seen as freedom, sometimes seen as self-knowledge. And Hegel clearly did think that those were in some sense the same thing. And I think a little more needs to be said about that because it's not at all clear, I think, to most people how self-knowledge can itself constitute freedom. Well, self-knowledge becomes freedom because of the particular nature of mind and of Hegel's idea that mind is the ultimate reality of the world. You see, in the historical process up to the point at which we recognize that, if you like, it's our world that we are all, up to that point, we have really been pawns in the game. We haven't been controlling the game. We haven't been controlling the historical stage because things have been happening to us without us realizing or understanding why they happen because what we take to be foreign and hostile aspects of the world are in fact part of us. But once we come to see that we are everything in the world, then we understand the process. We grasp, if you like, the laws of historical development and we see that those laws are in fact our own reason. They are the very laws of our mind and our thinking. This, was this behind the famous quotation that's often made from Hegel, the real is the rational and the rational is the real? That what exists does correspond to, to what is rational. Mind. That's yes, right. Yes. And when we come to see that, then we are free because we see the rationality of reality 
and it no longer strikes us as something contrary to our interests. We no longer struggle against it. We understand it as, in fact, our own, our own rational principle, and we are free to flow along with it and indeed to, to order it and direct it in accordance with those laws of reason. Now, one characteristic of Hegel's thought, which you've made very clear, is that he always sees ideas not just as existing in the abstract and certainly not being timeless and unchanging in the way that, say, Plato saw them, but as being embodied in societies and institutions and historical realities which change. Now, uh, given that fact, what sort of society does Hegel see this whole process as culminating in? What sort of society is it leading towards? Well, as you'd expect from what we've been saying, it's a rational society, a rationally ordered society. But I must make clear what that is for Hegel, because it's not the society of pure reason. Hegel saw the society of pure reason as typified by the kind of thing that the French revolutionaries wanted to do. You know, they didn't just uh, get rid of, of the king and the nobles and of religion, but they tried to make everything rational. They said, why have uh, months of irregular days? Why not make them all the same day, number of days? Why have weeks of seven days? Let's make them ten, like our decimal system of measurement and so on. Now, Hegel saw that as leading to a kind of uh, madly abstract notion of reason, rather like, for instance, the view of a town planner who might uh, look at a map of London and say, Oh, well, your streets all run crooked and uh, traffic has to make detours and so on. Uh, let's get rid of this. Let's tear all the buildings down, make nice straight streets. Uh, in each block, we'll put a big high-rise apartment. We can fit more people in. You can have a, a smooth green lawn outside for the children to play, and it'll all be beautiful and ordered and rational. Well, we've actually had that in London, and it's been catastrophic. That's right. And Hegel would have predicted that it would have been catastrophic because it was abstract reason taken to an extreme. For Hegel what a rational ordering of, of London town planning would be, would be to look at the real, that is London as it exists, find what's rational in the real, and of course it has developed the way it did for certain reasons, so there's the rational element, and then try and follow those reasons through in a way that fulfills the rationale behind London's development without trying to raise it down and start anew, to get rid of some of the arbitrary and capricious points perhaps that that are particular problems, but basically to find what's rational in what's real and enhance it and develop it and allow it to fulfil itself. One criticism that's always been brought forward against this conception of the state, the rational state, by uh, liberal philosophers in the Anglo-Saxon tradition especially, is that by seeing the state as an organic whole which behaves rationally and orders everything rationally, Hegel leaves no room at all for individual dissent, criticism, freedom, one can say, eccentricity. There's no room in the system for the individual to behave as he likes. What's your comment on that? I don't think there's any evidence that Hegel was opposed to uh, some individual freedoms. But what is true is that his view of freedom was not the standard Anglo-Saxon liberal view of freedom. To look at the difference between the two, let's shift to a somewhat different area, economics and, and the idea of, of freedom in, in the economic sphere, in the market. According to one view, the liberal view, freedom consists simply in people being able to do as they prefer. If I prefer to wear uh, an orange shirt this spring, for instance, then I, I'm free if I can do that. If I prefer to buy a deodorant, I'm free if I can do that. And that's all that the liberal economist will ask. Are you free to choose the preferences that you have to fulfill them. But some of the more radical economists have questioned that, and they've said that's a very superficial notion of freedom. You should ask, why do you want to wear an orange shirt this season? Why do you want to use a deodorant? Why don't you accept that uh, you know, a certain amount of natural body odor isn't a problem or whatever? And the radical economists will say the reason is that you've been manipulated. There are people who want to make a profit out of you buying their deodorant, out of you thinking that the clothes and the colours you wore last season are no longer good enough this season. So you've been manipulated. You're not free. You have to ask not only can you do what you prefer, but why do you prefer what you prefer? Are they rational preferences? Are they preferences that satisfy your needs? Now, Hegel would have been in the latter camp. He would have said freedom is more than just 
ability to follow your own caprice. Freedom must consist in fulfilling yourself as a rational individual. Well, that sounds all very well, but surely what it's going to mean in practice is that I, I think I know what I want. I want to wear an orange shirt this spring, and I want to go out and buy a deodorant in hot weather. But we have a state, perhaps, which says, no, no, you, you, you think you want those, but those are not rational preferences on your part. We know what's best for you. We know even what you would want if your preferences were rational. In other words, you get a state that not only knows what's good for you better than you do yourself, you actually get a state that knows what you want better than you know yourself. And surely that's authoritarian in the extreme in its relation to the individual. I think in practice you're probably right, and I don't know that Hegel has any reply to that objection. The only thing that he can say is that while it might be very difficult in practice to work out how you could have a society in which individuals genuinely realize their rational self without an authoritarian state, that doesn't mean that you've overcome the problem by the liberal laissez-faire notion. I mean, we still do have to face that problem that people's wants and desires might be being manipulated, and to the extent that they are, it's perhaps misleading to say that they're really free. In other words, it's still a problem, it's even if it, problem. Hegel doesn't necessarily have the right answer to it. Let's just take stock for a moment of where we've got in the discussion. Right at the very beginning, I asked you what you thought was the easiest way in to an understanding of Hegel's philosophy as a whole. And you replied that you thought the best starting point was with the philosophy of history. So we started there, and in fact, we've continued our discussion in a straight line, so to speak, to the point that we've now reached. Well, now, are we now in a better position to understand other aspects of Hegel's philosophy than we were? I think we've already, in fact, grasped some of the essentials of Hegel's logic, for instance, one of its most abstract points, because we've grasped the dialectic, which is part of logic, the idea of, of the thesis, antithesis, synthesis. Now, in the logic, one of the points Hegel makes is that logic is not just a matter of form as separate from content, which is the way the traditional logic of Aristotle was interpreted. He says that form and content are together, and we can see why he says that, because he thinks that this dialectic is something that is realized in the actual process of history. In logic, he says, you study that in the sense of you study truth without its husk, he put it. That is, the, the eternal immutable form of it, irrespective of a particular historical content. But in fact, it's always linked to that content. So that's one of the key ideas of the logic. And another point that we've also just touched on is this notion of ultimate reality and the way in which it's in some sense a matter of mind rather than a matter of uh, material things. It seems to me, looking at the exposition of Hegel's ideas that you've put forward up to this point, that there's one central concept out of which almost all the important other ideas naturally arise. The central concept is that understanding reality isn't understanding a given state of affairs, it's understanding a process, a process of perpetual change. The other concepts arise in the following natural order, it seems to me. If one asks oneself, what is it that's changing? Hegel's answer is, it is Geist which is changing, and you've explained what he means by that rather difficult concept, mind, spirit, whatever it may be. If one says, why is it changing? The answer is because, to begin with, it's in a state of alienation, and you've explained that. If one says, what is the process of change? What is the pattern of change? The answer is, it's the dialectical process. If you ask, where is all this change heading? The answer is, well, at the political and social level, it's heading towards an organic society, which we've discussed. At the philosophical level, it's all heading towards absolute knowledge, which you've at least touched on. So in this way, all these central concepts of Geist, alienation, dialectical change, the organic society, all arise out of a consideration of this central idea of reality as a process, as a historical process of change. Now, we've been able to put this very clearly, and the next question I want to ask you is, why didn't Hegel... We said right at the beginning that he's notoriously obscure. Sometimes philosophy students read out passages of Hegel aloud just to make everybody laugh, because it sounds like such gobbledygook. You can read page after page of Hegel sometimes 
and think, what the hell is he saying? Now, why wasn't he clear when it's possible to be clear about his ideas, as you indeed in your book have shown? Some of his less charitable critics thought that he was deliberately obscure in order to appear more profound, in order to cover what they took to be the shallowness of his ideas. But I don't think his ideas are shallow. I think they're, they're very deep and profound, and that, in fact, the difficulty comes from the nature of the ideas. One of his students said that whereas an eloquent lecturer might have had everything off by heart and would arrange it well and trot it out clearly, Hegel was always dredging up difficult ideas as he went along, as he lectured. He was bringing these ideas to the surface with great difficulty. And that's the style. The style is one of someone who is thinking aloud and having difficulty with the material. We may very well regret that he didn't then revise and polish it, but uh, in the context of German philosophical style at the time, it's not so surprising that he didn't feel the need for clarity that you just mentioned, because after all, Kant and Fichte, other contemporaries, were also very obscure, and they were still regarded as great philosophers. But the next question that that gives rise to is, how did it come about that a philosopher who was so obscure and so difficult to understand acquired, even in his lifetime, such immense influence? I think that's partly due to his situation at the University of Berlin, which was the capital of Prussia, which was then the rising state in Germany at the time, and also due to the fertility of his ideas in a variety of fields. You see, the influence that Hegel had is not just an influence in philosophy, it's an influence in theology, in history, in politics, in economics even, in law. Now, the fact that Hegel's ideas could be applied in those ways shows how fruitful his approach, and particularly the historical elements of his approach were, because it was that historical idea of things as having developed, as being a process, that could be applied by scholars in all these different areas. Let's come now to the immediate afterlife of Hegel's ideas. One of the first things that happened when he died was that his followers split into two movements, didn't they? They were known as the young Hegelians and the old Hegelians, or alternatively, the left Hegelians and the right Hegelians. Can you tell us something about this division? The right Hegelians were the people who thought that Hegel's philosophy implied that something like the Prussian state was the organic state which Hegel was pointing to. They thought that Hegel had himself said this in the philosophy of right, his most explicitly political work. He described a state, a constitutional monarchy, not very different from the Prussian state. And so they thought that there was no need really for further change. They were the conservative or right-wing Hegelians. The left Hegelians said the basic thrust of Hegel's philosophy is much more radical than that. You see, Hegel talked, as we said at the beginning, about overcoming the division between reason and desire or between morality and self-interest. That's a very fundamental change to bring about. You can't say that that's occurred in, in the Prussia of 1830 or whatever. So uh, they said the thrust of Hegel's philosophy is for a much more far-reaching change, a revolutionary change. Now, they had to admit that in the philosophy of right, Hegel hadn't written as if he were a revolutionary, but they'd pointed out the fact that Hegel's salary was paid by the state of Prussia. So they said Hegel compromised. He sold out. But we must be truer to Hegel than Hegel was to himself. We must carry the ideas forward until we get to the point at which these thesis antithesis of reason and desire, morality and self-interest are overcome and we reach the synthesis of a harmonious society in which those gulfs and divisions in human nature are reconciled. And of course, as soon as you talk about the revolutionary followers of Hegel, onto the scene marches the greatest revolutionary thinker of the modern era, Karl Marx, because he was a young, one of the young Hegelians. And I think it's very striking, after the whole of our discussion up to this point, to list the fundamental ideas of Hegelianism that we've talked about, which Marx simply took over and incorporated into Marxism. Among these are, first, the idea that reality is a historical process. Second, that this process changes by a, a, a dialectical movement dialectical change, historical dialectic. Third, that it's all going towards a goal, 
Fourth, that that goal is a conflict-free society. And fifth, that until we get there to the conflict-free society, we're condemned to remain in one form or another of alienation. Now, all these absolutely central ideas of Marxism were taken over lock, stock, and barrel from Hegel. One has to say that there's one huge difference, and it's this, that whereas Hegel, as we've been saying all along, was an idealist, and to Hegel, all these things were seen as happening to mind or spirit, to Geist, as you said, in the case of Marx, he saw all these things as happening to something material. Marx was a materialist. But the whole pattern of ideas remains the same. It's as if Marx has taken over a great long set of equations from Hegel, substituted a different value for x in the equations, matter instead of mind, but kept the whole set of equations in every other respect the same. That's right, and you can see it, for instance, in Marx's materialist conception of history, the key thing in Marx's thought, where history develops by the economic base, the material side, the forces of production, as dominating the mental, so that our ideas, our religion, our politics, all flow from the kind of economic structure that we have in our society. And that's an inversion of Hegel's idea. As Marx himself said, he stood Hegel on his head, because for Hegel, it was the development of ideas, of ideas of freedom and so on, that led to the formation of particular societies and particular historical epochs. Do you think that Karl Marx could be said to have made any important original contribution of his own to philosophy? I don't think Marx made important contributions to philosophy in the, the narrow sense in which we talk about problems of the ultimate nature of reality. Uh, I think that Marx was certainly a materialist, but he didn't argue for his materialism as a philosopher. He really accepted it as something that was pretty obvious that what mattered was, was the material Stuff, world, yeah. this, this kind of thing, yeah. and not something remote mm -hmm. like Geist, mm -hmm. which he more or less dismissed as a kind of speculative German metaphysical abstraction. So uh, he didn't argue for that, and he didn't, didn't therefore make contributions to that philosophical discussion. But what he did do was give us a kind of a vision, a vision of a world in which we are controlled by our economic circumstances and in which we are therefore not free. It's still rather like Hegel in that we are, we are pawns in the game of history. And in order to become free, we must control the economic forces, which after all are our own forces. What is economics after all? But our own ways of providing for food, providing for shelter, and so on. So it's a vision in which the things that we do control us, and we instead must control them. That's a powerful and broadly philosophical vision of the human situation. But it's not an important philosophical discovery in the narrow or academic sense of the word philosophy. Now, taking the two uh, very closely linked philosophies of Hegelianism and Marxism together, what would you say has been their uh, most important, or some of their most important, positive contributions to human thought? What have they given us that's really useful in our understanding of the world? Well, it's clear from what we've said that the idea of history as a process, which affects every aspect of our thinking and our ideas, is a crucial thing that's come from Hegel and Marx. It became almost the dominant thing in the 19th century, didn't it, as with evolution, seeing everything as having evolved, having developed. We can't now imagine looking at societies or ideas as timeless entities independent of their history. And that's something that we owe uh, to Hegel and Marx. And that's, so that's one very important thing. The other thing is this notion of freedom, the idea that is distinct from the, the liberal notion that we cannot be free unless we control our destiny, unless we, instead of being blown about by the winds of economic circumstances for Marx or uh, the unseen hand of reason for Hegel, unless we actually take control of it, realize our own power, realize the capacity of human beings collectively to control our destiny and grasp that. That may, as you said, have some dangerous tendencies in it, but it's a very important idea, and I don't think it's one that we can ever give up. 
once we've been presented with it by Hegel and Marx. But now, I do have to ask you about the minuses as well as the pluses. Uh, the ideas of both of these philosophers have become associated in the 20th century, since their deaths, with totalitarianism. Hegel with German nationalism culminating in Hitler, and Marx with communism, which was seen at its most horrific in the state created by Stalin. Both of these societies were societies that murdered millions of their own people. Now, I'm not suggesting that either of the two philosophers would ever have expected that, and certainly not that they would have wanted it. But they were both philosophers who regarded the embodiment of ideas in history, in institutions, in social reality, as being an essential feature of ideas. Yet when their own ideas were so embodied, they had these catastrophic results. Why was that? Well, I think their own ideas were misembodied. I don't think you can really trace Hegelian ideas at all in Hitler's kind of racist nationalism. You can't find that kind of racism. They said so, but you Hegel. think that was a complete it, misrepresentation. It was a complete misrepresentation yes. of, of Hegel in that yes. case, certainly. Yes. And also, and it's perhaps the ultimate irony, in, in what happened to Marx, Marx, as I've been saying, was a philosopher of freedom. He cherished freedom. He hated subordination. He was once asked by his daughter to write down what, his, what the vice that he most detested was. He replied, servility. Servility, the very vice, the very thing you needed to survive in Stalin's totalitarianism, of course. Mm. And yet it's true that these ideas did get misapplied, did get distorted. Well, now, why? What is there about the ideas that led to this uh, outcome? I think in the end there's a faulty view of human nature. Partly there's an attempt to show a greater unity than really exists between human beings. And we could trace this to Hegel's notion of mind or geist as something which is above and beyond the differences between individual minds. But we find it also in, in Marx and in the idea that if you change the economic circumstances, you'll change human nature and then we will all overcome the divisions between one and another, the division between my interest and your interest and our individual interest and the interest of society. They will all disappear once we get rid of the economic structure which leads us to compete in the marketplace for money and wealth and so on. Now, it seems, unfortunately, that that has proven false, that you can change the economic basis, but you don't get rid of the divisions between reason and desire, between my interest and yours, or between individual and society. That in fact what happens once you make it impossible or very difficult for people to compete with each other for wealth is they then start competing for status or for power or something of that sort. And that's no better than it used to be. In fact, you could say that in the case of Stalin's society, it proved to be worse. So I think that Marx was mistaken in thinking that human nature would change. Thank you very much, Professor Singer.